Today, though, is our third in our series titled Hashtag. That's what those things up there uh, are all about. Our series is titled Hashtag Counterculture. And what we are doing is that we are using the most searched hashtags, those things up there, that are used in social media, and we're comparing that to the Bible, right? Particularly the book of Proverbs. But not only the book of Proverbs, we're getting those hashtag search and really using all of Scripture to see what those search is all about versus what the Bible tells us. Let me explain what I mean. You see this hashtag, right? I had one couple come up to me after I explained what this whole hashtag nonsense is all about, and they said, thank you for clearing that up, Pastor, because I didn't know what the fuss is with all those hashtags. And so anyway, this hashtag, or what I used to know, because I'm, I'm older than sin, I'm just kidding, I used to know it as the pound sign. Anybody with me on that, right? We used to know it as the pound sign. Anyway, it is putting that hashtag now in front of a word or a phrase, putting it all together, and by doing so, when you do that, it is now being collected all under that same hashtag all over the world continuously. And so get, to give that illustration once again, an explanation, that first series that we did, some of you will remember, was hashtag love. And that one hashtag, hashtag love, had 696 million posts just on Instagram. That doesn't include all the other social media sites, just Instagram. Hashtag love had 696 million posts. And so you see, people will hashtag love, and then people will post on social media all sorts of stuff using that hashtag. On Instagram, of course, that's a, that's a photo site, uh, social media site. With love, they'll associate things like pets. You'll see pictures of pets, of people, cars. And that's really the point, isn't it? You see, by posting our own interpretation, the posts tend to be all over the place. That's why we're going to the Bible to look for those answers. So this morning, I want us to look at Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 to get an idea of why it's all over the place. Now, if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand, and one of the ushers will throw one at you. I'm just kidding. Or you can load up your, your devices and go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 14, verse 12. I'm going to read from the message this morning. I love that translation as it kind of hits today. It says, there's a way of life that looks harmless enough. It says, look again. It leads straight to hell. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end in heartbreak. And you need to know something. God wants us to have a good life. God is not the downer, although when you read that, you're like, ooh, boo, boo the Lord. No, you see, you need to understand something. We are the one that makes life a downer when we allow Satan to lead us. Instead of what God wants for us. And what is it that God wants for us? It's found in John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 says that Christ came to give you life and for you to have it abundantly. You see, today's hashtag is hashtag me. You would have really liked that video. But anyway, in, that Huff, in Huffington Post, now this is not one of the cutting edge news cir uh, circulations out there. It's actually kind of a left-leaning uh, post, but anyway, in the Huffington Post, there was a great article titled Hazards of the Me Culture, and they cite the downfall of a celebrity. His name is Brian Williams. He's the anchor of the NBC Nightly News, and he took over that position from Tom Brokaw. Now, Brian Williams messed up in that in his accounts of being in war areas, okay, several, he, he added a little uh, seasoning in what he went through. The problem is that he was stationed with some military folks and they came out and said, no, it, it didn't happen quite like that. We were mostly in the barracks. And so this author, he says about Brian's troubles, it came from, listen to, it came from a need to be interesting. And the main motivator for him to be interesting came from social media sites. Imagine that. And I would cite what we just read in Proverbs, right? That we do things because we deem it harmless. What's a little seasoning? And of course, this leads into that me position. It's all about me. Listen to this poem that I found. It's untitled. 
it says, I love this, it says, I wonder if it's self-centered to say that one of my favorite things about you is that you genuinely like me. Wow. Mac Davis, back in the 1980s, I'm showing my age, that's 1980s for you young people. Actually, the song was released in 1980. I think Robert knows where I'm go uh, going. He wrote a song titled, Oh Lord, It's Hard to Be Humble. Let me give you the lyrics, the starting lyrics. It says, Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Oh Lord, I can't wait to look in the morning because I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be a hell of a man. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. Now you fast forward that to 2008 and little Jackie sang a song titled, The Whole World Should Revolve Around Me. Now, of course, that's all a bit shocking, right? Many of us would say, oh, no, Pastor, I'm, I'm not like that. I'm not stuck on me. And, well, that's the point, isn't it? You see, many of us, we see our own character flaws, our actions, our desires, our goals as harmless. But yet when confronted, that's where things go bad, right? And another poem that's also untitled, some of these guys are kind of scared to, I guess, title it, it says this, sometimes I wonder, am I more saint or sinner? Is it self-preservation or selfish and me-centered? Kind of sounds like that end of the Proverbs 13 that we read, 14, 13, right? People appear to be having a good time, but all that laughter will end in heartbreak. What I'd like to do today is look at a parable. It's known as the prodigal son. Now, a parable is just simply a story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson. And just an FYI, Jesus was the master at this. And this parable is found in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. We won't have time to read the whole thing this morning. We're going to take snippets of it. But when you have time, please go to Luke chapter 15, verse 11 through 32. Read it. It's incredibly profound. You know, I hope to do a, a small little series just on the prodigal son, about three or four messages, because it's just so rich with different ideas. Now, Jesus used this parable along with other parables in chapter 15 of Luke. He talks about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and in an effort to teach the religious leaders about the way the Father, which is God, how God really wants to reconcile humanity with himself. And not how the religious leaders were thinking, with rules and regulations. And so that final parable he, now Jesus, uses is the prodigal son that we're going to kind of look to format today's message. What I want us to take notice in this parable are two characters that are found here with that me selfish, me bad mentality. Okay? Now listen, most of us have been in this me position that we're going to see this morning that is found in this parable, maybe not to the extreme, but nonetheless, I think we can see glimpses of ourselves here. The two characters in that me position, of course, is the younger son that leaves the home, and then the second older son that stays at home, okay? But both of them are all about me in some way. Let's look at the first one in this parable, the younger son, and it's found in verses 12 and 13 of Luke chapter 15. So go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Go ahead and look it up on screen. It says, the younger of them said to his father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. And so he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. See, what I want us to see from that first son is two big indicators of that, look at the screen there, your bad me, your bad hashtag me, okay? The first one that you're going down the wrong path is number one in your outline, it is a sinful desire. The first indicator, it's a sinful desire. Now, listen to me, desire is not a bad thing. I love how the psalmist talks about desire. In Psalm 42, verse 1, it says, As the deer pants for the water, my soul pants for you, 
See, he's talking about that desire, right? But that is not what this younger son is all about, right? You see, desire, when driven to sin, did you hear me? When your desire drives you to sin, that then becomes a bad thing. Look at verses 12 and 13. This guy says, give me mine right now. Now, he's talking about the inheritance. So what does that mean? You see, he is asking for his, di- for his dad really to die, right? Now, we in our culture, we don't really see it that way, right? It's not such a bad thing. And you know why? Because we can get a, a loan on the assets, even future fa- uh, assets that might be coming to us. There's a loan for inheritances, right? Like A.G. Uh, AG Edwards that, that, that provides that. But in that culture, in this parable, this is a very bad thing. This son is asking for his dad to die. Heck, he can't even wait for this to happen, so it's insult to injury. He is bringing disgrace to that entire family. But listen, isn't that true about our sinful desires? This me-first attitude, when desire driven to sin... Doesn't that thing itself we desire, that is sinful. Doesn't that then just kind of enchain us? It it, it harms us? I've experienced it for myself. And now as a pastor, I see the painful effects of it in the people that I get to pastor. A spouse may be uh, not taking care of their health. A spouse that maybe is enabling another spouse to do bad habits, spending, whatever. And the entire family hurts. A friend of mine several years ago, we couldn't believe this, but a friend of mine, he takes a vacation all by himself because the whole family couldn't go. So he takes off for two and a half weeks overseas, right? It becomes a sinful desire. The second thing on that bad hashtag me is sinfulness causes us to flee. You see, the sinfulness, it will cause you to flee. We see this in the young man, don't we? He, he takes off in verse 13. You can see there for himself, right? He, he gathers everything. He takes off and he loses it all on loose living. And we see what loose living is all about, right? In the verses that follow. In friends, in partying, in women, in stuff, in clothes, whatever. But, but take notice that when our desires are sinful, it causes us to flee from good, doesn't it? It causes us to flee. I mean, later, later on, we see his dad, right, who he wants dead. Anyway, this same dad forgives him and takes that son back. This son later reflects and takes notice of how good his dad is once he's been driven to nothing by his own will. You see, the desire that that son had wasn't just for the money. You need to understand that. This son's desire was not just for the money, nor was it for the parties, the people, the clothes. It wasn't that. It was a desire to do what he wanted. And you see, and what he wanted to do was sinful. And so it causes him to flee from the family, to flee from the father. Again, I get to see this very often. Lives are broken. Friends and families are torn apart. Not because what they wanted was good, but because the sinful desire causes them to flee from others. You know, when, when, when those things in that bad hashtag me happen, it always, li- listen to me, it always leads to the, the three Ds. It's not in your outline. Bernie's looking for it. It's not in the three, D- it's not in the outline. It leads to three Ds. You may want to write these down. Destitution, degradation, and despair. It'll always lead you to that when you flee. Destitution, degradation, and despair. You see, this guy in verse 14 He runs out of cash, has no more friends. He's completely destitute. And then in verse 15 and 16, he sells himself off as a slave feeding pigs. You see, this is bad. To a Jew feeding pigs, this is a huge no-no. And this guy is looking at what the pigs are now eating in the trough and is wanting to eat what the pigs are eating. That is complete degradation of his character. And then in verse 17, we see, he says, here I am, dying of hunger, complete despair. You see, this type of me 
leads to the three D's. But there's another bad me in this story. What we'll call the clean bad hashtag me, right? Because we, ha we all have a clean bad me, don't we? Come on. Y'all like, no, man, I haven't seen any of those in me yet. You will in this one. In your outline, it is an inflated sense of goodness. Oh, brother, do we have to go there, pastor? This one's the inflated sense of goodness, right? It's kind of like, well, Pastor Christian dresses all hip and cool, but he wears a tie, right? And you know, I believe that this one here is the ugliest of them all, this clean bad. When I see it in myself, it really ticks me off that I, that I come to this place. I really do believe that this one is the worst because this one leads to the most destruction because, listen, we can hide it from ourselves, right? That's the, that's the reason why. You see, the older brother is the one with that me attitude. He hears all the commotion when he comes back home, the party. His dad is throwing a party for the youngest son who went and, and left it all. The older brother is coming back from the fields from working, and he comes back to the news. Look at verses 29 and 30 with me. They're in Luke. Again. But he answered and said to the father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you. And I have never, be careful when you use the word never. And I have never neglected a command of yours. You see, what he's saying is that I followed all your rules and for what? And yet, you have never given me a young goat. I will go, let me go get you a goat. So anyway, so that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, I love that, right? You parents know exactly what that's it. Hey, you know what your kid did today? Ah, canijo, your kid? It's not ours anymore? That's what this brother's doing, right? But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth, wow, what a dramatization, right? He devoured all their wealth? No, of course not. They still have stuff. But he's making the point, right? Who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. Man, is that a great example of an inflated sense of good or what? I mean, think about that. You see, when we have this type of hashtag me, that idealism, it's all about me, with a self-righteous outlook, it gives, listen, a faulty sense of grace, doesn't it? Right? Well, you know, those Muslims, they're going to hell anyway, right? Those guys, they don't even know Christ. Those gay people, right? Good grief, you know, whatever. Those lawyers, I'm just kidding about the lawyers, but you get my point. I had someone tag our parking, don't park outside sign outside. It said something like, Pastor, don't be a fool helping drug addicts. Listen to me on this. We are all in that same situation as those addicts. That is, all of us have sin. All of us need Christ, and Christ then gives us the church for that very reason. But you know, what was being displayed on that graffiti was an inflated sense of goodness, wasn't it? I can only guess, but I would think that whoever tagged us is also one of those panhandlers outside. And so they feel that their personal trouble wasn't bad as those other drug addicts. Listen. When the me shows up like this, you will inflate your sense of goodness and you will have a faulty view of grace. You will have a grumbling, complaining spirit, won't you? So how do you combat that in your life? How can we have a good me instead of a bad hashtag me? I'm glad you asked. Let's look at Romans chapter 13, verse 11. He says, as you all do this, you know what time it is, right? I love this. You know, that bad hashtag me won't work. Come on now. It, it's not going to work. Here's the hook on how to get that accomplished. So here's the boom. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your sleep. Sleep meaning that you were in, a, in sin and now you're awake. Now, our salvation is nearer than we, we first had faith. Okay? 
the night is almost over. Night meaning uh, the darkness of sin. And the day is near, right? Because now Jesus is coming back. So let's get rid of the actions that belong to the darkness. Those me selfish attitudes, that pride attitude. And put on the weapons of light. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, not in partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsession. Instead, I love this, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't plan to indulge your selfish desires. Boom. So three things to combat that bad me, to become a good me, if you will. First thing you got to do is you got to kick out actions that belong to the darkness. It starts with actions. Those actions that are sinful, right? Look at verse 12 again. So let's get rid of those actions that belong to the darkness and put on the weapons of light. Ever take notice when you're all alone with your thoughts? That, that when you see that bad me attitude, that, selfish, that selfishness, that self-pity in others, that's when you criticize it a bit harder? Listen, you crit criticize it harsher in others when that attitude, listen, is similar to how you act and behave. Now don't answer and don't look at the person next to you, but you know I'm right. I believe it was Spurgeon that said, how wicked our sins look on others. But listen, if you are having that type of reaction like that, start with you. In Philippians 4.8, we did a whole series. It's up on our YouTube channel. It's titled Whatever, if you don't know what that is. The Apostle Paul gives us a list of things that we can work on, things that we should pursue, things like truth and holiness and love. So the first thing you got to do is kick out bad actions and reactions. Second, you got to behave appropriately. The second thing is you have to behave appropriately. I don't think you all know what appropriately is. I think when, when my mom or dad or a family member, occasionally a friend would say, hey, act your age. Yeah, I know what they mean, but I like this more, behave appropriate. And so the question is, what is appropriate? And I'm going to give you all that gotcha here in a little bit. Look at Romans chapter 13, 13. Romans 13, 13. Let's behave appropriately as people who live in the day, not in partying and getting drunk, not in sleeping around and obscene behavior, not in fighting and obsessions. Do you see that? I think most of us, most have been taught by someone or at least by society that we are to behave in an appropriate rate, way, right? I, I remember that as a kid, I would go to a church with my grandma you know, in our finest Sunday wear, and my cousin, who was also very small, we we're like six and seven years old, and my cousin would sit next to me, and he'd make me laugh during, during church, you know, when the priest would be giving his thing, right? Grandma would get mad. She would separate us. He'd lean over, and he, and I'd go, he, right? And she'd pinch us under the arm. You Spanish speakers know what I'm talking about. That is not a very nice way of saying, shut your trap. She was trying to teach us appropriate behavior. I've got scarred. <laughs> Heck, the Apostle Paul gives you a list, no less. Right there, look at it in verse 13. It says, don't go partying. Some are saying, boo. Don't be getting drunk. Don't sleep around. Like if the act of sleeping is even taking place. But anyway, don't act obscene. Right? Maybe some of the politicians to take notice of this. But anyway, don't fight and don't obsess. So there's your list. That's the problem, isn't it? It's just another list again. May I challenge you that Paul is just adding this in, right? For all the clueless people out there, this list. You see, I am convinced that although we saw it in the prodigal son, or should I say sons, that although that was a parable that Jesus uses, a story that the father in that parable probably also taught those kids, also gave those kids a list. And yet, and yet those boys in their own way did not fight back in their characters 
because they had this list. Let me challenge you with this question. Why come? Why? Why did that happen? Seemed like the boys were old enough to know. Looks like the dad always had their best interest in mind. And so he taught them well. So why didn't they revert back to that list? Look at verse 13, what Paul says. Paul says, behave appropriately, doesn't he? Did you see that? Listen to me. Oh, man. Here's the whole thing about being the best good me. Oh, man. Get ready. Paul, in, in Romans 7, beginning in verse 15, more or less, you don't have to go there, has that same thing, that same question going on within him. Some of you are familiar with that, right? Why can't I do the things that I need to do that are right? Why do I keep doing this sinful stuff? Have you ever been like that, like Paul? Like those two kids in the parable? The wheels fall off with the craziness? Sinful living, right? Or, or, or your self-righteousness holds compassion back from you? Or maybe you, you, you act out here and, and right now you're, 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 you're struggling right now this morning to do the right thing? And coming to church is just on the list of good things to do? Maybe, uh, maybe taking... Me out to lunch is on that list. You can still do that. Don't stop that. But anyone know what I'm talking about? In verse 25 in Romans is the solution to win, to behave appropriately. And you see it. It, 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 it ain't what you do. Listen. Or what you might think. No. Paul says it's Christ. It is making Christ the person that I need to be. Listen, in Galatians 2.20, that's my personal life verse, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. You see, listen, we fail when we don't act like Jesus. And we fail to act like Jesus because, listen, we forget, we forgot all about the crucifixion, didn't we? When we behaved at it. That's the issue. Not that Jesus loves me, we know that. Not that, that, that we're scared that he's not going to save us or rescue me. Heck, it is even an, an, an issue of him dying for me. You're cool with that. Listen, it is that you and I, we forget of how terrible, crushing, humiliating, the torture that he went through, and it paid it for us and for me. And the least that we can do what Paul is saying is behave appropriately to how Christ is asking you to live. With mercy and compassion, not like a fool. You see, we are children of the Most High. Act like it. So kick out the bad habits. Then behave like Christ. And last, I got on my soapbox, I, I know. And third, you got to put on Jesus. Third thing to do is you got to put on Jesus. Look at verse 14. It says, instead, dress yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, from all the superheroes that are out there, one of my favorites is the concept of Iron Man. I like me Iron Man. I don't like Tony Stark, but I love the power in that suit. Woo, yeah, I like it. Heck, I, I, I love that suit. And even Rhodey... His sidekick, James Rhodes, Tony's friend, when he puts on Iron Patriot. I love those suits. They can fly. They can break through walls, lift amazing weights. They're full of high-tech stuff. They get shooty, blasty things. And they look nice. They look really nice. Anyway, I guess you can tell that I really like Iron Man movies. But you know, the reason I like Iron Man is because the suits give them those normal humans, unbelievable powers, right? They can't do any of that stuff without the suits. And you know, Rhodey and Tony, they know this also. That's, that's the thing, isn't it? In order for them to combat evil and listen, to do good and do good, they got to put on those suits. And so Paul here in verse 14 is saying the same thing. The boys in the prodigal story failed because, listen, they didn't put on Jesus. 
Those, their, their, their religious upbringings, they didn't do a thing for them. All the lists they have. And listen, that is why you are having a difficult time maybe. Let me explain. You see, in 2 Corinthians 6.14, Paul asks a great question. He asks, what does light have to do with darkness? See, we, we know that now scientifically that darkness is just the absence of light. That's a great question, man. You see, some of you are having one heck of a time because when you act, behave, or think like you did B.C., meaning before Christ, right? And you act that same way, what happens? It brings about guilt. You don't enjoy those things that you did. You can't find who you are now because you were a total mess or maybe you weren't so bad. But you know what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened. Jesus now lives in your heart. Listen, Christ, the Bible says, he clothes himself in light. You find that in Psalm 104, verse 2. It says in 1 John 2, 6, look at it with me. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. And so three things to be the best good me, Paul is saying. He's saying here in Romans, wake up, clean up, and grow up. Boom. Now listen. Don't go making another list with what I just said. Pastor said, okay, what do you say? Wake up, clean up, and grow up. And tack it on your spouse's forehead. No, don't do that. No, no, no. That's just another list. I mean, yeah, consider the list. But listen, let us not forget why we are doing it to begin with. Right? If we can do that, we would walk in victory, not for victory. I don't think you all heard me. If we can live in and with Christ, we can walk in victory, not for victory. But we have to remember, we want to do this because of the love that Jesus demonstrated to us. By dying, listen, a brutal death. We are therefore crucified with Christ Jesus. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who, listen, Loved me and gave himself for me. Live a life that is appropriate to our Lord and to our God. He is a loving God. Let's pray. You know, Father, I know that many of us, we've messed up. We messed up and we're, we're doing things still. We, we go off and goof around and get drunk. Or maybe it's not so bad. We go off and buy things that we shouldn't be and it hurts our family. Or maybe, Lord, our attitude towards others does not reflect how good you are to us. And so we're selfish when we hurt others with our attitude, our spouse, our kids. And so we come on Sunday mornings to get another list. Oh, pastor said do this, pastor said do that. The Bible says that I need to do this or that. Father, forgive us when we take that attitude and that we put you on over us like a garment so that we can reflect your grace and mercy. And we do that knowing that you paid such a horrible price on that cross. Father, when the selfishness comes in, when the bad hashtag me comes in, Lord, help us to be revolted in seeing our sin displayed on a cross. Where you were beaten and flogged and spat on. You were beaten for my sins. What did you have to do with me, Lord? Lord. Help us to remember that you did that willingly and lovingly so that we could be saved. Generate a heart in us to have that always in our minds when we're being selfish. And Lord, so not that we're guilty or shameful, but so that we can glorify your name and say, in this day and in this way, I will leave it all behind and I will follow you. Give us the courage and the strength to seek you through the cross and thank you for the cross. 
We give you all honor and glory this day. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And all those that agreed said, Amen. I want to thank you all for coming out this Sunday morning. Have a blessed week. If you need some prayer, the teams will be up here. Or if you have any questions, come on up. We'd love to talk to you. Have a great week.